if you uh, have a Bible, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to open to the Old Testament. If you don't know where that is, just open your Bible, and you've got about a two-thirds chance of getting it right. <laughs> Let me encourage you also to pull out those notes from that pretty thick packet that we're going to try to dive into together tonight. Two, uh, two images captivate my mind as we come together tonight. The first is of uh, the first opportunity that I had to be with underground house churches in Asia. And uh, just by the grace of God, he opened up a door for, um, for them to invite me to come and, and to, to do some training with them. That was not a part of the plan in that trip to this part of Asia, um, but they invited me to come and we sit down and I didn't know what to expect, walked into a room, see a small group of believers gathered together in a circle and uh, we start studying God's word about two in the afternoon and by 10 o'clock at night we're still going strong and they look at me and they said, we need you to teach us all the books of the Old Testament. <laughs> and so that began a journey over the next two weeks where we did that and the people who would gather together and these are most of them farmers agricultural workers uh, who completely laid down everything for two weeks um, at great cost to them and their families to come together about 12 hours a day to study God's Word together. Uh, just a deep passion for God's Word and wanting to make the most out of the opportunity they have to study it. The second picture that captivates me as uh, I stand before you tonight is uh, of our brothers and sisters in Sudan part of the focus of our time together as we focus on Africa tonight and, and sitting there in mud huts in the Sudan, these believers who have grown, many of them grown up with war over the last 20 years and seen about a million of our brothers and sisters die at their sides during that time and to teach them and the entire time teaching them to hardly ever see their faces the entire time, hardly ever make an eye contact, not because they were asleep not because they were, they were daydreaming off somewhere else, but because they were writing down every single thing I said because they knew and they would come up to me afterwards and they would say, David, we know we have a responsibility to take everything you've taught us and teach it in our tribes, to translate it in our languages and teach it in our tribes. And I give you those two pictures for two reasons. Number one, the picture in Asia of believers who gathered together intentionally for just deep time in the study of God's Word. As you look at the uh, packet of notes you've got, it's fairly thick. And some of you may be a little intimidated at this point with the things that uh, at least we're going to try our best to cover over four hours tonight. And some of you may be thinking, wow, this is going to be overload. Well, I hope that's what you're thinking because we are going to fill each other with the knowledge of God's Word so deep tonight that we will be overflowing by the time we leave here. And this is... The purpose of our time together tonight is not entertainment. The purpose is to get into God's Word. And I believe we will find great fulfillment when we do that. So I just want you to know this is, this is more seminary class than it is Sunday morning service. And it's not for the faint of heart or mind. And, and so I, I pray that we will keep our mind and our attention devoted to His Word. And we're going we're gonna to get in as much as we possibly can to make the most of our time together tonight, which means we'll be flying through some of this stuff. Just do your best to, to keep up. The second picture from Sudan I give you because the overarching purpose of our time together tonight is not to have a greater knowledge of the Old Testament, although I think that would be great. The purpose of our time together tonight is not to be able to study the Old Testament more effectively in each of our personal lives, although that would be a great byproduct as well. My purpose in our time together tonight is to lead us in such a way that when we leave this place, every single one of us would be able to take these notes and reteach the Old Testament to somebody else. If what we do tonight stops in here, in your life, then we have missed the entire point. We have received and we have given ourselves to a self-centered study of God's Word. However, if what we do tonight is aimed at reproducing everything that's been entrusted to us from God's Word and teaching in others' lives, then we'll be a part of making disciples of all nations. And it won't just be thinking about the people in Africa. We'll be a, have an opportunity to impact people in Africa as a result of what's going on. My prayer is that an army of believers from this room would be equipped to teach the Old Testament as a result of our time together tonight. So, with that said, we're going we're gonna to dive right in. It is quite a task. Uh, 
an overview of the Old Testament. I kind of feel like, you ever heard of Larry Lawnchair? You ever heard of this guy, Larry Walters? True story, years ago. Here's how it goes. Larry's boyhood dream was to fly. When he graduated from high school, he joined the Air Force in hopes of becoming a pilot. Unfortunately, poor eyesight disqualified him. When he, followed, when he was finally discharged, he had to satisfy himself with watching jets fly over his backyard. One day, though, Larry had a bright idea. He decided he was going to fly. He went to a local store and purchased 45 weather balloons and several tanks of helium. The weather balloons, when fully inflated, would measure more than four feet across. So back home, Larry securely strapped the balloons to his sturdy lawn chair. He anchored the chair to the bumper of his Jeep and inflated the balloons with helium and then climbed on for a test while it was still only a few feet above the ground. Satisfied it would work, Larry packed several sandwiches and drinks, loaded his pellet gun, figuring he could pop a few balloons when it was time to descend, and he went back to the floating lawn chair. He'd have tied himself in along with his pellet gun and provision. Larry's plan was to lazily float up to a height of about 30 feet above his backyard after severing the anchor and in a few hours come back down. Things didn't quite work out that way. When he cut the cord anchor in the lawn chair to his Jeep, Larry did not float lazily up to 30 or so feet. Instead, he streaked into the L.A. sky as if shot from a cannon. <laughs> he did not level off at 30 feet, nor did he level off at 100 feet. After climbing and climbing, he leveled off at approximately 16,000 feet in the air. <laughs> Can you imagine being in a lawn chair at 16,000 feet in the air? At that height, he couldn't risk shooting any of the balloons lest he unbalance the load and really find himself in trouble. So he stayed there, drifting cold and frightened for many hours. Then he got in real trouble. He found himself drifting into the primary approach corridor of Long Beach International Airport. A United pilot first spotted Larry. He radioed the tower and described passing a guy in a lawn chair. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, you got a guy in a lawn chair up here, and he has a gun. <laughs> Meanwhile, Larry, feeling cold and dizzy in the thin air, three miles above the ground, shot, began to shoot several of the balloons with a pellet gun to bring himself back down to earth. He attempted to aim his descent at a large expanse of grass of a North Long Beach country club, but Larry came up short and ended up entangling his tethers in a set of high-voltage power lines <laughs> about 10 miles off of his liftoff site. The plastic tethers protected Walters from electrocution as he dangled above the ground <laughs> until firemen and utility crews could cut the power to the lines. Larry managed to maneuver his chair over a wall, step out, and cut the chair free. He was later quoted as saying, a guy just can't sit around. <laughs> I kind of feel like Larry tonight, if I can be honest with you. We are going, to, we are going to, uh, to go up pretty high and get an overview of the books of the Old Testament and what they reveal about God and ultimately our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to go up pretty high, and it may be a little uncomfortable at times, but I say let's cut the tether's loose, and take it for what it's worth. Here we go. If you got your notes there, why study the Old Testament? Why is it important that we even gather together to spend time studying the Old Testament? Some common myths that we throw out. Number one, the Old Testament is insignificant. Many times we think, this is just background material for the New Testament. It's almost like, why would we want to pay attention to the the, the second or the first half of the game, if we want to, if we already know the, the results of the second half of the game, why would we, why would we want to sit in the stands way back there while you're blocked from your view, than really be on the field seeing what unfolds in the New Testament? The Old Testament is insignificant. It really, it's really not that significant for us today in the 21st century. Second common myth: the Old Testament is irrelevant. 
contains a lot of stuff that we don't observe anymore that really don't seem to relate to our lives. There's a lot of people, even in Christianity, who say that this book is for, more for Israel, not for us. Let's be honest, what relevance can an ancient animal slaughtering religion that talks about God in a portable tent have for Christianity in the 21st century? What does that really have to do with us? You ever read a passage in the Old Testament and just think, why, Lord, did you decide that that would be included? 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came up out of the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. <laughs> Go on up, you bald head. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Students, be encouraged. This is how youth ministry is represented in the Old Testament. Why, why, why do we need to know about the bears taking out the youths? Um, so the Old Testament, this is irrelevant. What does it have to do with us? So you didn't know the Old Testament was going to be so much fun, did you? Okay, third, the Old Testament is inconsistent. The Old Testament is inconsistent. It doesn't make sense in light of the New Testament. This is where a lot of people disconnect the Old Testament from Christianity as a whole. They look at the Old Testament as a Jewish book. As well as uh, even cults use the Old Testament. Mormons use the Old Testament. Even Muslims use parts of the Old Testament as part of their scriptures. So why would, why would the Old Testament and the New Testament, how do they go together? They seem inconsistent, particularly. And this is one of the most common questions in, uh, in house churches that I've been in. Why? Why would the, the God of grace and love and mercy and compassion that we see unfold in the New Testament, why would we see this picture of judgment and wrath and punishment of sin in the Old Testament? How do those go together? How do you reconcile the judgment that we see in the Old Testament, whether it's 42 poor youths or whole nations that are being wiped out? How do you justify that with a God of love and grace and mercy? It seems inconsistent. Next, finally, the Old Testament is incomprehensible incomprehensible and by that basically we're just we're just thinking it's cumbersome it's confusing it doesn't make sense and it often leads us to boredom apathy and neglect it's just plain hard to understand these book are la books are large they're filled with all kinds of history that many of us don't know and unpronounceable names that we never could begin to talk about how do you how do you really begin to understand this it's overwhelming it's long it's tedious we're a lot more familiar in the gospels where we see Jesus so we use the Old Testament every once in a while in our quiet times, but the bulk of our faith is dependent on the New Testament. The Old Testament is just, it doesn't make sense. Well, those are myths that I hope will be dispelled tonight by one central message. The Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen, is invaluable. It's invaluable. If we abandon the books of the Old Testament, then we abandon the revelation of God. Let me say that one more time. We've we got to get a hold of this. If we abandon the books of the Old Testament, we abandon the revelation of God. And more than that, we hinder our ability to understand the New Testament's revelation of God. If we abandon the Old Testament, we'll never get the picture the New Testament is trying to teach us. It's key. You might write this down. There are at least 1,600 direct quotations of the Old Testament and the New Testament. At least 1,600. In addition to all kinds of other allusions and, and references to it. If we don't get what the Old Testament teaches, we'll never get Christ. It's important for us to remember the Lord of the universe who gave us this book does not waste words. He gave us all of this book for a reason. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not confusing, that sometimes it's tedious, that sometimes it doesn't make sense. And I'll go ahead and, and be honest. I'm not going to be able tonight to answer all the questions that we may have that come up in the Old Testament. There are so many. We could spend a couple of secret church nights just looking at questions that come out that we wonder from studying the Old Testament. But my, my desire is for us to see an overall picture of what God is doing and why the Old Testament is so important. What we're going to do, how should we study the Old Testament? I want us to look at the Old Testament through three different lenses or three different dimensions, three different perspectives on the Old Testament. First one, number one, the literary dimension. And by that I mean this is a, this is a book. The Old Testament is, is a book. It's a piece of literature. And so we're going to think about it just real briefly tonight. Is what kind of literature is this? And how does that affect the way we understand the Old Testament? So number one, the literary dimension. Number two, the historical dimension. This is a real history of real people. 
And we're gonna, we're gonna dive in a little bit just to get a background for understanding the history. Most of us probably have little knowledge of the overall history of the Old Testament and how all this ties together. The Old Testament is a fragmented book for us and it, we kind of try to piece it together in our minds but it just doesn't make sense. So I want us to walk away tonight with an overall knowledge of the history and how all this fits together. So we'll look at it from a literary perspective, a historical perspective, and then third, a theological dimension. This book was not just written to tell us a story about history, but it was written to demonstrate God in the middle of history. And that's what theology is, the study of God. So here's an overview for how we're going to approach our time together tonight. Two parts. This part, we'll, we'll break at about nine, and then we'll come back together uh, for our second part. And what we're going to do is during the first part, part we're going to hit the, the literary and the historical overview. And we're going to get a picture, and hopefully, we've, we've got in your notes, we're going to dive into as many Old Testament books as we can, just to give an overview of how they fit together. And then, with that basic foundation, that's going to lay the foundation for part two, which is where we're going to see the overall storyline of how God is revealing himself, not only to the people of Israel, not only to the people of the New Testament, but to us today. And we're going to see the riches and the beauty of the Testament unfold. We've got to get a foundation in order to get there, though. And so we're going to dive into the literary historical in this first part, and then we'll get to the second part. Hopefully that will help us stay awake come about 11.30 or 11.45. All right? The Old Testament is literature. The Old Testament is literature. The Old Testament is a collection of 39 books. 39 books. 39 books in the Old Testament. How many in the New Testament? 27. 66 total. So you got 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Traditionally, when it comes to classifying the different types of literature, it's traditionally classified according to different genres. Genres or types of literature. So you've got people who say, well, you've got the law at the beginning. Then you've got history. Then you've got prophecy. And you've got poetry. And so we divide it up against a, a much different genres. But that... That kind of classification really doesn't do justice to the literary picture that the Old Testament is giving us because it is rich in literary form. It's rich in literary form. It's got more than just a law and a history and prophecy and poetry. It's a lot deeper than that. It's rich in literary form with historical narratives. It does have stories, pictures of what's happened in history. But not just that. It's got laws and statutes. It's got laws that God has given to his people. It's got prophetic oracles pronouncing things that are happening in the future. It's got genealogies. Genealogies, by the way, with a purpose, not just a list of names so we can get through that chapter quicker than other chapters by skimming down to the back. There, there's a reason. There's a reason. Oh, you do it, okay? You say, God knows. He doesn't think I need to know all these names. So you just go to the end. You say, I've read my chapter for the day. Genealogies, but they're there for a purpose. There's a reason he's given us these names isn't it good to know that we have a God who is concerned about us as individuals and who knows your name? Let that transform the way you look at a genealogy, to know that God counts your name as valuable. And not just this whole picture, but your name. Genealogies. Then you've got songs. You've got things that are intended to be sung in the Old Testament. We won't be doing any of that tonight. I won't be leading in that way. Uh, wisdom sayings. You got wisdom sayings. You have apocalyptic visions. And this is where it gets really extravagant, kind of wild in the Old Testament. You've got visions, apocalyptic visions, like Daniel, which we'll dive into a little later. Many more. All kinds of different literary forms come together. And knowing each of those affects the way we're going to understand the Old Testament, knowing that there's different types of literature here. So when we come to the book of Proverbs, we're going to read it differently than we're going to read the book of 1 Samuel. When we come to the book of Leviticus, we're not going to skip over it so we can get to the good stuff in, in 1 Kings. No, we're going, to, we're going to dive into Leviticus and we're going to appreciate what it is for the type of form that it is, the laws that were given to the priests. So, all that to say, rich in literary form. It's written by a variety of authors. Don't forget, though, one divine author. One divine author of the whole Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God taking all kinds of different men, different servants, and the beauty of Scripture, and we could dive into this much deeper, but the beauty of Scripture is God, the Holy Spirit, inspiring men just like you and me, their personalities, their gifts, their talents, their passions, 
and bringing God and man together to produce a book that is completely divinely inspired but also written by human authors. It's an incredible picture of this book and that makes it unlike any other book. One divine author, the Holy Spirit, various human authors, predominantly written in what? Hebrew. Predominantly written in Hebrew, though some is in Aramaic. Predominantly written in Hebrew, though some is in Aramaic. It's written over a span of around about a thousand years. About a thousand years. Now this is where we get into, and there is a variety of issues that we'll see tonight that are really open to discussion, debate, even among biblical scholars. Biblical scholars who are following Christ still debate about some of these things, but it's about a thousand years. What I'm going to try to do tonight is really focus on what we do know and leave some of the things that the Old Testament doesn't tell us specifically. Or trust that that's not as important as the things that the Old Testament does tell us specifically. So, uh, written over a span of about a thousand years, earliest parts written around 1500 B.C., give or take a couple hundred years based on your view of when the Exodus happened. Most common two views of when the Exodus happened were either in the 15th century or the 13th century as when God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt through Moses. So either that happened in the 15th century or the 13th century, most likely. And what you've got is Moses, who's writing these first books in the Bible, who, who would write it during that time, either the 15th century, 13th century, somewhere in there. And then you've also got a, a book like Job that is in the middle of our Bible but was actually written, possibly even one of the first books written, if not the first book written in the Old Testament. could have been even before the Exodus. So you've got around 1500 B.C. and the latest part's written around 400 B.C. And that's where you come to Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and the, that closes out the history, 400 B.C. And you've got about 400 years of silence until you get to the New Testament. You get to Christ, known as the intertestamental period. That's more than you wanted. Okay, over a span of about 1,000 years, 1,500 to B.C. to about 400 B.C. How did we get the Old Testament? How did we get the Old Testament? It's collected, the Old Testament is collected into a canon by God's people, a canon. Now, a canon, that word literally means a measurement of standard or a, a, a measuring stick. Now, take that two ways, a measuring standard. Take it two ways. Number one, in order for a book to be included in the Old Testament, to be included in the canon, it had to meet up to certain standards. It, they would look at who wrote it. They would look at when was it written, how was it written, and they would look at how it corresponded to the rest of the revelation that God had given through other books. And that was really, if you had to simplify how books were included in the canon, those were kind of the three, three criteria. Who wrote it, who was the audience, and how does it fit with everything else? And based on that, that, that was the standard by which books would be included by God's people in the Old Testament and how he led them to get us to these 39 books. But it's also a standard in the sense that these are the books, the canon, by which our lives as God's people are measured. So there's a measurement for the book to be included in. As the book is included in the canon of the Old Testament, then our lives are put up as a mirror to these books to see how we measure up. So, that's what it means to be collected into a canon, transmitted through scribes, transmitted through, through scribes. This is where history gets really fascinating. I just want you to think about the book that you're holding in your hands, the Bible, specifically the Old Testament tonight, to realize that there have been countless people over the last few thousand years who have given their lives to making sure this word passes from generation to generation to generation. Scribes who had no word processing software, scribes who did not have computers, even typewriters, who were writing out by hand the words of the Old Testament so they would be passed down to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next, and it's an amazing thought that these scribes would do that. We are indebted to them some may wonder, Dave, why are you so passionate about the word in the church? Here's why. Because there is a whole lineage of people who has been faithful to pass this word on from generation to generation. And God help us not to let it stop here. We're not going to ignore the word in the church. We're going to highlight the word in the church. It's going to be supreme. And we're going to follow in the tradition of those who have sacrificed their lives to make sure that word gets passed on. And that's our obligation. That is our responsibility as God's people. It's transmitted through them. Transmitted through scribes and then translated through various servants. Different people have translated along the way. The Septuagint. Let's say that together. Isn't that a fun word? Septuagint. That is the Greek Old Testament. The Greek Old Testament is called the Septuagint. 
We have dates to about 200, 300 B.C. And so many of the New Testament authors, when they quote from the Old Testament, were using the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. This whole idea that it was translated into Greek, which affected the New Testament. But then, obviously, down the years, Adam and Eve did not speak English. I know that's a blow to our ego tonight. But neither did the Israelites. Moses didn't know English. Abraham, no English. David, no English. Jesus didn't even. Well, he knew it. Okay, he knew it. <laughs> he knew it. But we need to realize that, once again, we are indebted to servants who have translated this book into our language. And on that note, I want to remind you that over 2,500 languages in the world still have no Bible translation. 2,500. An additional 1,000 have only the New Testament. What that means is over half of the languages in the world still don't have the books we're going to talk about tonight. Over the half of the languages in the world still don't have the Old Testament. And ladies and gentlemen, we have the resources to, to put a dent in those numbers in the church in America. God help us to be faithful to translate as servants of the word. So that's a picture of, of basically the, the literature of the Old Testament. That is a brief overview. We have run through that. I don't want to spend too much time there. But it gives us a picture of how we got this book and how, how it got from the point where it was written to the point where we are studying it tonight. When and where did the Old Testament, the events of the Old Testament take place? Thinking about the historical dimension. Moving on from literary to historical. When do they take place? Don't forget the Old Testament is a real story set in real history. And I want to emphasize that because we have this tendency to almost view this book as a mythological picture, fables, stories from the past that may or may not be true. Even in the church, especially in the United States, it's being doubted in many different circles. Well, is this really true? This is a real history, a real story of real people, not just a book of wise religious counsel and theological propositions. It's real places, real people, in real time. Real places, real people, in real time. I want us to, to grab a hold of that. When we begin to unlock some of these things that are in the Old Testament, to remember this is not just, just stories that we're telling each other. This is true. This is real. Real places, real people, in real time. Now, I want to give you a, a history of the Old Testament in about two pages, okay? We're going to fly through this, and I just want you to get an overview. Again, we're Larry Launch here, okay? You've got a view from 16,000 feet in the air right now, okay? Looking down, here's what happened. In the beginning, nothing, then something. It's that simple. Now, that's a, a part of much debate in our culture today. But nothing cannot produce something apart from someone. Nothing cannot produce something apart from someone. You got nothing one day, and if you have nothing, then what can you get out of nothing? Out of nothing, nothing comes. See, that's deep. Out of nothing, <laughs> nothing comes. But you've got nothing one day, and then you've got something. You've got creation, life, creatures, and man made in God's image. Man and woman created in the image of God, his prized creation. And placed in the Garden of Eden, which quickly becomes the location of the fall of man. By Genesis chapter 3, bad news creeps in. Garden of Eden quickly becomes the location of the fall of man. Humankind then de degenerates for many generations, and God judges the world with a what? With a flood. Judges the world with a flood, but he spares one righteous man. Who? Noah. Spares him and his family. Problem is, after that happens, Noah and his family, generations after him, don't do much better. There's not much improvement. So what happens is, humankind rebels at the Tower of Babel. The result is division and dispersion. And you've got a new beginning. And God's faithfulness to Abraham and his family begins to unfold. God begins to call out Abraham. Is the, a leader of his people. Now, from that point, Abraham's prosperity turns into Israel's slavery. Abraham leads the people of God by the promise of God through his different generations, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and the result is the end of Genesis. You've got people in slavery. What that means is the exodus is necessary. The exodus, Moses leads Israel out of Egypt. So the exodus happens. They led out of slavery. And God gives Israel, once they come out, two things. God gives Israel the law, 
He gives them his word, the Ten Commandments. He gives them the law. And then the people enter the promised what? Land. They enter the promised land where they are ruled for a while by judges. They enter into the promised land and judges rule them. Eventually, a kingdom is established, epitomized by King David and his son Solomon. There they are in the promised land. Judges are ruling them. See the need for a king? You got Saul, David, then Solomon. Solomon, in his reign, builds a what? A temple, which becomes the home of the Ark of the Covenant and the center of the people's worship. After Solomon dies, though, the kingdom divides into Israel, which is the northern kingdom, and Judah, which is the southern kingdom. Very good. You had two, Israel and Judah. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. They had divided. It was united. Saul, David, Solomon, divided. Now you've got Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Idolatry grows in both places. Assyria then destroys Israel in 722 B.C. The nation of Assyria attacks Israel and destroys the nation of Israel. Then Babylon destroys Judah from 597 to 586 B.C. Ultimately, the temple is destroyed in 586 B.C. And the survivors are taken to exile in Babylon for the next 70 years. Survivors are taken there. They're in exile for 70 years. And then a remnant basically a part of the people, come back to Jerusalem, they rebuild the temple. But Israel still longs for the glory it knew under David. That is the history, the story behind the Old Testament. Made simple. That's, that's the whole picture. Everything that is from Genesis to Malachi is encompassed in that story right there. The only problem is the Old Testament has become a story without an ending. You've got the people of Israel longing for the glory it knew under David. I want you to look in your notes there. You've got, you've got a couple of maps that we may refer to at a couple different points. Look at those maps where you see, uh, number one, that, that geograph geographical summary of the Old Testament. You can, you can see how this story was played out. If you look on the far right of this map, you see a, uh, a place called Ur, kind of the bottom right part of that map. That's, that's where Abraham it starts, goes north, and Haran goes, you, you can follow the line around, comes into Egypt, number three there. Then the exodus happens over to number four. They go to Mount Sinai. He gives the law, promises them the land. They go to five. They wander around in circles for a while. And then they go up to number six. They go into the promised land. You see Canaan right there. And that's where it begins to unfold. They're ruled by judges. Then they're united in a monarchy. Saul, David, Solomon right in there at Jerusalem, the center there. And then uh, Saul, David, Solomon. And then you've got the kingdom divided, the northern half of that, that land of Canaan and the southern half, Israel and, and Judah. Israel is attacked by Babylon, or Israel is attacked by Assyria, which is up in the, the northeast. Judah's attacked by Babylon, which you see on the east, right on the right side over there. And they're taken. You see a, a line that goes from Canaan over to Babylon and back. That's the exile. They come back, and they come there. They rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem, and they're longing for the glory. That's the glory of, of, of Israel. That's the picture of the Old Testament. The second map you've got on the back of that is uh, I wanted to give you a picture of, of a modern-day picture of this area of the world. Just so we remember, this is real history in real places, real time. What you've got is a picture here, and you see Egypt in the bottom left there in the southwest corner. But you see Iraq and Jordan, of course, Israel, Syria. This is where all of this was happening. That gives you a new perspective on what you see on CNN, Fox News, to think about this part of the, part of the world that, quite honestly, is so volatile today was the, the place where all of these things that we read on a daily basis were unfolding in these different areas. So hopefully that will give you a picture. This is kind of a map that's a combination of both. And then the Old Testament overview, that's a picture, almost a timeline of the history we just looked at, persons involved in that, um, and then the, when the books were written, which we'll, we'll dive into in just a second. But I hope those will be just a couple of resources that you might turn back to occasionally just to kind of help to make sense of this whole picture. Um, but it's a story without an ending. Gets to the point, still longing for the glory of Israel. Okay, we've gotten the literary picture and the historical picture. We're flying through here. Now I, wanna, I want us to dive into an overview of the books of the Old Testament. I want us to dive into an overview of the books of the Old Testament. Um, we are not going to be able, you think about it, 39 books. We don't have that much time left in this session for 39 books, that is. I mean, it at two minutes apiece, we got, we're, we're finished with our time together. So we're going to do the best we can. I want to give you a picture, a resource that you can begin to get a picture of the overall scheme from book to book to book, how it all fits together 
If we get to the end, we don't have enough time to get them all, then we'll be able to, the notes are already available on the internet right now, so you can fill in some of the notes if you miss them. Um, but I want us to get a picture of each of the books and how it fits into this history and the literary dimension of it. And again, this is going to lay the foundation for us to really dive into the theology. So, with that said, what you've got with the books of the Old Testament are three main divisions. Three main divisions. The story of the Old Testament, story about God's people, that's first. And, and this is something, I know that we're, we're flying through this may be a little difficult, but even right now, you might want to turn to your table of contents there in the Old Testament. And you can almost kind of, as, as, we, as we walk through this, as you, if you have time, if you can write it over there fast enough to take the table of contents and block out, okay, first 17 books from Genesis all the way to Esther, the story of God's people. And so... One of the things that I like to do is, is a lot of the information you've got in here, I write it out in my Bible. If, you're not, if you think it's bad to write in your Bible, then please don't write in your Bible. But if you think it's okay, then, then I would encourage you to do so. Um, but I, I kind of write out some of these things to help get an outline, to help picture. So Genesis to Esther, you've got the story of God's people. And it's fairly chronological for the most part. We'll see how it mixes it up a little bit. But basically from Genesis to Esther, you've got a chronological picture of the history of God's people that we just talked about. From creation all the way to, to uh, the, the remnant coming back to Jerusalem rebuilding the temple. That's what you've got from Genesis to Esther. The story of God's people. The history. Second, you've got the writings of God's people. And that's the next five books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Those are the writings of God's people. What they are is writings that God's people have given that fit into the history that came before that. So they don't continue the history. We're used to. Our minds are trained. We read books chronologically. They go together, one after another. And so we think Job happened after Esther. Not the case. Job, like I mentioned before, happened way previous. And so you've got Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, which are basically, I look at it this way. Those first 17 books given us God, God's story among his people, how he was moving. And it's very God-centered. And what you've got in Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon is man's response in the middle of that history. How was man responding along the way, whether it was in praise and wisdom and struggling through different things and in suffering. You've got man's response coming up. So you've got the writings of God's people. And then starting with Isaiah and going all the way to Malachi, you have the prophets from among God's people. So you got three major divisions, 17, 5, and 7. The prophets from among God's people being the last, from Isaiah to Malachi. They're split up into, many people split them up into major prophets and minor prophets. Isaiah through Daniel would be major prophets, and then Hosea through Malachi would be minor prophets. That doesn't mean poor Hosea was less important than Isaiah. Let's not, let's not you know, slight Hosea or Joel or Amos. Sure, they didn't write a lot, but they made, they made a they made their words count, that's for sure. So you've got a picture of, basically they're called minor prophets mainly because they're smaller. Um, that's the primary reason they're called minor prophets. So you've got major prophets and then minor prophets. So that's the picture. And what the prophets do is fit in, and we'll see this in just a second, historically into the time that we see mainly in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, the last part of that history. The prophets were not prophesying in the beginning and creation as they were wandering in the promised land prophets began to rise up, and these particular prophets that are included in the Old Testament really come about when we get the picture of the monarchy, get the picture of the kings, and, and the division of the kingdom, and, and Israel being destroy, destroyed by Assyria, Babylon, being, uh, Babylon coming over and destroying Judah. So that's the picture, the story, the writings, and then the prophets from among God's people. What I want to do is I want to give an overview of each of those sections each section, the story, then the writings, and the prophets. And then for each book, I'm going to give you just kind of two pictures. And one, just primary information for starters. And by that, I basically mean just basic, basic information that's going to affect the way we understand that book. Now, in a lot of cases, especially if we were doing the New Testament, that would always include the author who wrote the book. Problem is, authorship was not that important to the, the Hebrew, Hebrew writers. A lot of these books, we don't know exactly who wrote them. There's a lot of guesses about them. But in those cases, I'm not going to say, well, this person is the author. We don't really know on some of those things. So I'll give you the information we do know. Really kind of a, for each of these books, there'll be a summary statement that I think encapsulates everything that goes on in that particular book. 
And then uh, the second part, practical advice for study, some things to think about as we read through that book and to look for. Maybe it'll open our eyes to help us understand how this all fits together so it's not this, just this jumbled picture that we often have in the Old Testament. So, story about God's people. Overview of the section. Divided into two major ca categories. Now, this is the first 17 books, Genesis to Esther. You with me? Genesis to Esther. We've got an overview, and you've got two main groups. First of all, the law, or the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch basically means five books. Five books of the law. So the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, that's the law. And then you've got the history, which is Joshua through Esther. So it's really split up into two categories there. Kind of like we're going to see major prophets and minor prophets. Here we see the law and the history. And the essential character of these books is narrative, which basically means it's telling us the story of God's people, Israel. It's telling us the story of God's people, Israel. Remember, Israel is going to come about. We're going to see that name when God, when God interacts with Jacob and he says, I'm going to change your name. You'll be called Israel. And that begins the picture uh, that's, that's started with Abraham as they begin to be referred to as the people of God, the people of Israel. God is the Holy One of Israel. It's the story of God's people, Israel. Now, what we need to remember is that means what, what this picture is, because it's historical narrative, because it's a story, even books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they fit into a story. They're a part of the story. They're not just books that were included there to, to add a little, well, whatever Leviticus adds to the Old Testament, to that, that kind of picture. The, these all fit in the story. Even Leviticus, Deuteronomy are part of this picture, the story. So... Let's start with Genesis. Primary information for starters. Anybody know who probably wrote the author, who was the author of the five books of the law? I already said that, didn't I? Yeah, okay, Moses. Well, good, or you already knew it. Uh, throughout, throughout the books of the law, we see Moses constantly receiving directives from the Lord. Uh, Jesus, Paul, John, all attributed these books to Moses' writings. If Jesus thought Moses wrote it, I'm with him. I think I'm going to go with that. So, the thing is, Moses wrote most of this, but there's a lot of likelihood that he had some help along the way, whether it was Josh or other folks, who helped plug in some things here and there. Moses is the primary writer, but, for example, you get to the, the end of the books of the law, and Moses, Moses passes away. I don't think he wrote that particular section, uh, unless he just got a, a picture the day before and was able to write it down. So there were some things that had to be filled in along the way. All right, <laughs> Genesis literally means beginning. Genesis literally means beginning, in the beginning. That's what Genesis means. What you've got is two pictures in Genesis, before the fall, which is the beginning of creation, before the fall. And then after the fall, you've got the beginning of God's plan to redeem his creation. Now, that's a, that's a thick word that we're going to unfold later tonight, but it basically means restore his creation or to recreate, to, to bring them back from what happened after the fall to restore them. So that's what happens after the fall, before the fall and after the fall. Some practical advice for study. What we need to realize is just like a, a good novel that you read, the introduction is huge. And if you don't get a hold of the introduction, the rest of it's not going to make sense. That means the first 11 chapters of Genesis are foundational to the rest of the Bible. The first 11 chapters are foundational. The picture we see unfold there, when you're studying Genesis, really camp out in Genesis 1 through 11 because there are things that are unfolding there that are huge. The major themes of the Bible begin to unfold. The sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, which basically means the God who is in control. That is from the start in this thing. God is the creator. All of creation works according to his plan his desires, his power. He has all authority over all creation. That's what it means for God to be sovereign. What we're going to see all throughout this book is people wrestling with that foundational theme. A guy like Job. Is God in control of this? People of Israel, when they're being destroyed by Babylon, is God still in control? All throughout, you're going to see people wrestling with that. You ever wrestle with God's sovereignty? God, are, are you in control? What's going on in my life? What, why is this happening? How can this be explained? Why is, is that person being prospered and I'm falling apart? God's people are wrestling with those questions. This is a constant source of wrestling, but it's also a constant rock for God's people because it's not an easy 
picture to, to get of the sovereignty of God. But as we grab a hold of it and as that picture unfolds, to know that no matter what happens to any one of us in this room, there is a God who is in control, that has a purpose, and his purpose will be accomplished. And he is all wise, he is all good, he is all loving, and he is all gracious. That's huge. And that unfolds from the very beginning in Genesis. So the sovereignty of God, the sinfulness of man, uh, if, you'll, if you're going to be here on uh, Sunday, we're going to dive into Genesis chapter 3 and really study that in depth. An incredible passage of God's, of God's sovereignty, man's sinfulness, but this third element, the promise of redemption. The promise of redemption. The beautiful thing is, in the very beginning of the Bible, within the first three chapters, you see all of those on just a mammoth scale. Get a hold of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. You got a hold of much of what the New Testament teaches us about who God is, about who Christ is, because Christ, believe it or not, is, is seen there in Genesis chapter 3. The promise of redemption, the sinfulness of man. Okay, I'm starting to preach my sermon for Sunday. Let's move on. Uh, catch hold not only the major themes, but the major plot. This is not two minutes on Genesis, is it? Okay. Uh, Major plot, God's gracious election of Abraham's family. Now that word makes uh, some of you cringe a little bit. Election of God's family. Oh no, you're bringing Calvinism into the Old Testament. Well, Calvin came much later, okay? Much later after this picture. But there is, there is a picture of Abraham not doing anything to earn or merit a God calling him, pouring out his affection on him. God is electing him by grace. God is pouring out his grace, choosing to pour out his grace on Abraham. Now, you hang with me, and we'll get to some other parts of this later on in the Old Testament, okay? But God is graciously electing him, and you see that over and over again throughout his line. Abraham, and you got Isaac, and you got Jacob. How about Jacob and Esau? One chosen by God, the other not. How does this work? God's grace being poured out. Okay, just hang with me on that, okay? Then you got Joseph. All throughout, it's God's gracious election of Abraham's family. He is choosing to pour out his affection on his people. The, the ultimate truth here, that regardless of what you might think about Calvinism all the way across this room, praise God that he has chosen to show his affection to you and me. We did not earn it. We did not deserve it. We have not merited it. And not one of us deserves to be in this room tonight. However, God in his grace has chosen to pour out his love and mercy on us. And for that, he is worthy of all of our praise. So, the Old Testament is good. All right. Some minor subplots that we're going to see unfold in Genesis. Already looking to Christ. I mentioned that, 315. Sacrifice, remember Abraham and his son Isaac, the sacrifice in Genesis chapter 2, 22, a picture of what Christ, who Christ is. 35, 11 through 13, 49, and 8 through 12. You look at those two passages, and what you see is it's a promise that's given to Jacob that kings are going to come from his line. Jacob at the end, when, 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 when uh, he's blessing his sons, and he says to Judah, he says, through you, there's one who will come? Look at this. You got to see it. Genesis chapter 49. Okay. We're, we're, I know we're going to move on in just a second to Exodus. Uh, but I want you to see this. Look at Genesis chapter 49. What happens is uh, Jacob is blessing his sons and he says something to each different one of them. I want you to look at what he says to Judah. Look at what happens in Genesis chapter 49, verse 9. He says to Judah, You are a lion's club, O Judah. Cub, O Judah. <laughs> You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. That's good. Did you catch that? New Testament, Jesus is known as the lion of the tribe of Judah, until the scepter, the rule, the authority comes to him to whom it belongs. It belongs to him, and the obedience of the nations will be his. So, you got this picture, looking to Christ. Another minor subplot, covenants. I say minor kind of subplot. That's not minor. Covenants is huge throughout. 
but you're seeing it unfold for the first time with Noah, the covenant with him, even Adam, though it's not called a covenant, you've got a covenant. What a covenant basically means is a, a contractual agreement, almost like I picture covenants as mainly like marriage ceremonies, marriage commitments. You unite your life and you commit your life to each other. And that's the picture we're seeing unfold, what God does with Adam, what God does with Mo Noah, and then what God does with Abraham. Also notice that there are major flaws and main characters throughout the book of Genesis. And this is where we learn. Now don't miss this. This is where we learn very early on in the Old Testament that these people were not given us, the stories of real people were not given to us so we would emulate them. Now, I'm not saying that there are some, not some good qualities along the way that we're going to learn from guys in the Old Testament. There certainly are. But nobody wants to live like Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Jacob the deceiver. Nobody wants to live like Moses. He missed out on the promised land because of his disobedience. Nobody wants to live like David. Well, he was a man after his own heart. Yeah, yeah, he was. And God gives us a picture of that for a reason. But nobody in here is called to emulate David, to imitate David with our lives. It's all pointing to one character. And so we're seeing some major character flaws at the very beginning for a reason. Because it shows us, it shows us the insufficiency of man, and it shows us the sufficiency of God. Because his purpose and his promises are going to continue even despite major flaws. Isn't it good to know that God works in spite of of our weaknesses and that the, the success of the church of Brook Hills, praise the Lord, is not dependent on the character, lack of character flaws in a pastor. That is great encouragement to know that God is faithful and he will accomplish his purpose even through our weaknesses. So, all right, I'm preaching like sermons on each of these. I got to move on. Don't forget, Genesis was not written to answer every question we may have about these events. Let me say that one more time. Genesis was not written to answer every question we may have about these events. Well, what about evolution? What about dinosaurs? There's all kinds of questions that you can come up with that are not answered in the book of Genesis. I'm not saying they're not good questions, they're not important questions, but they're not answered. So we don't need to try to make an answer. Well, this animal must have been the dinosaur. That's not necessary. God has given us his revelation to give us what we need to know him, to know his character, to be in a relationship with him. That's the purpose of the Bible, not to answer every question we may have. Even the idea of evolution. Well, is, a, is it a, people say, the, theistic evolution? Is it God creating through a process of evolution? Is it, is it days as in 24-hour days, or is it? A day with you, God, is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. How long was the day? Did it all happen in one day? How does that square with science? The answers are not all over the book of Genesis, but, but we can know this. There's absolutely nothing that unfolds in Scripture that in the end ultimately is going to contradict what we know from observing science. Nothing. And we can, we, it's, not that it's not important to think through some of those issues. We can think through some of those issues. We need to. But to think, even, even the idea of evolution or God creating through a process of evolution misses out on some of the things that we do know. Evolution is built on random chance, and we know that there's nothing random about what's going on behind the activity of a sovereign God in the book of Genesis. Evolution is built on this idea that we over a process of time, went from this sort of species to another sort of species. And that completely contradicts what we do know in Genesis. It talks about man being created unique in the image of God, unlike any other part of his creation. So, focus on what we do know. Leave some of the room open for what we don't know. Don't try to answer every question in the world based on what we see to unfold there. Okay. That's, that's the book of Genesis. All right. Moving on to book number two. Um... <laughs> It's too good. I'm telling you, it's too good. When I turned this in, Gene was like, not going to happen. So we're going to do our best, okay? <laughs> Exodus. Exodus. Primary information for starters. <laughs> literally means, Exodus literally means departure. Departure. God is all-powerful and mighty to save. That's the picture that unfolds in the first half of the book of Exodus. Exodus 1 through 19. Remember the history behind this thing. God's people in slavery in Egypt at the beginning. Moses 
risen up as the leader of God's people, and they depart from slavery out of Egypt into to, to up to Sinai and then to wander around for a while. That's where it's going. So it's a departure from slavery. Second half of the book, focusing on how God is faithful to his covenant. That's when God gives his people in chapter 20 the what? Ten Commandments, right there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 17, you see the Ten Commandments unfold. God gives his people the law, establishes his covenant, the Mosaic covenant. We saw Abraham in covenant with God, Noah in covenant with God, Adam in covenant with God, and now that covenant is transferred over to Moses and the people of God as they're brought out. So that's some primary information, the picture of Exodus. Literally means this is the story of how God's people came out, out of slavery into this this, into Sinai and the place where they established their covenant with God. Practical advice for study. Notice three defining moments in Israel's history. Number one, the deliverance from slavery. Number two, the significance of God's presence. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that more later on in the evening. But the significance of God's presence, because God established his presence through his people, to his, with his people through something called the tabernacle. We'll dive into that later. But the terms of the covenant, number three. How Basically, a covenant, the covenant that unfolds in Exodus is, is God's commitment to his people and his description of how they will relate to him and walk with him and enjoy him. Just like he had said to Adam and Eve, walk with me and enjoy me. Don't do this. Don't eat from this tree. Now he's saying, here's what you do, here's what you don't do. As you walk with me, it's a covenant, that contractual agreement, that commitment to each other like a marriage. So the terms of the covenant, key chapters two main chapters. Exodus chapter 12, which is the sacrifice of the lamb that makes the deliverance from slavery possible. The sacrifice of the lamb is huge. The Passover. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 20, which we mentioned just a second ago, the giving of the law. So the sacrifice of the lamb and the giving of the law or the Ten Commandments. Those are two pivotal chapters. When you, when you come to Exodus, really camp out on those two chapters. And really dive into what those mean. Key places. Egypt, you can look at your map there. Egypt, as they go from Egypt across the Red Sea. As God parts the Red Sea. And then come to Mount Sinai. And that's where God establishes covenant. Mount Sinai is a very important place in the book of Exodus. Here, and this is where we're going to come back to that whole, that whole grace of selection of, Israel, uh, of Abraham. God choosing to pour out his grace on people. How does God's sovereignty work? When you read Exodus, I want you to look for both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. They're both there. When God is bringing his people out of Egypt and, and Pharaoh is fighting against that, there are times where it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that makes us wonder, well, what in the world? God does that to people? But at the same time, there are ten times where it says that. There are also ten times where it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. What we're seeing set up here, and I wanted to give you those verses because this is becoming a big issue in the church today. How does, how does God's election work or sovereignty work with man's responsibility? Do we have choice? I want you to see they're both unfolding in Scripture from the very beginning. And say, well, how do you reconcile those two together? Well, you don't reconcile two friends. You don't have to reconcile friends. They go together. How they go together? That's a great question. It's a great question, but... The important thing is to see that God's sovereignty and man's responsibility aren't going against each other. They work together in this picture. That's what's unfolding there in the book of Exodus. Here's the deal. If we don't understand Exodus, we will never understand the New Testament. If we don't understand Exodus, we'll never understand the New Testament. When Jesus comes on the scene and John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that seems weird if you don't know Exodus doesn't make sense. Greatest religious teacher in the history of the world, and they're calling him a lamb. What does that mean? Well, in order to understand that, you've got to know Exodus. So, know Exodus, know the New Testament. Next book, Leviticus. Primary information. Now, they've led, they've brought, and brought to Mount Sinai. That's where this takes place, the book of Leviticus. It's referred to as the law of the priests, the Levites. Literally means pertaining to the Levites, the law of the priests. The Levites were the members of, of, of Aaron's family who were responsible for helping the priests in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was how God dwelt among his people, and the priests were the intermediaries between God and his people. That's what it meant to be a priest, which we'll talk about more. That's a rich picture, which we'll dive into. But basically, this is a book primarily about holiness. Over 90 times, holiness, be holy. 
This is holy. I'm holy. It's mentioned 90 times. That's over and over again in the book of Leviticus. It's also a book about sacrifice. It's a book about sacrifice. Because in order to come before a holy God, there had to be a sacrifice to make the way for that to happen. In order for sinful man who is not holy to approach a holy God, what we're seeing set up in Leviticus is the necessity of sacrifice. And that's huge. See how this is important. Two main sections as you study it. First, first half, 1 through 17, is talking about fellowship, walking with God through, through ritual offerings. Let's talk about the offerings that, that the people of God were to do. And it, it designates different time for the people of God were supposed to give this offering or this offering at different points of the year to celebrate this. And then the, the last part, 18 through 27, talks about walking with God through righteous living. That it's not just about giving your offering. It's about walking with God and obeying Him. There's a lot of meaning there. For, for us today, it's not just about bringing your songs. It's about giving your lives. It's not just about rituals that we do in our church culture. It's about, it's about walking with God on a daily basis. Leviticus has meaning for us today. One main chapter, Leviticus chapter 16, known as the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Atone literally means to cover. That word is used 45 times in the book. That means it's important. That because of our sin, somehow that sin has to be covered. And it's covered in this day of atonement, day of covering. And what happens is you've got two necessary elements on the day of atonement. Number one is a bold priest. A bold priest. And by that I mean the, the high priest would go into the presence of God at this designated time, the guy would have to wear bells so that when he was walking, you could hear it. So that when he went into the presence of God, everybody standing outside would listen real closely to make sure that the guy was still moving, make sure he hadn't been struck down in the presence of God. Can you imagine the tension of that scene? When we send Larry Herndon into there and, <laughs> and he's got bells on and we're just listening, is Larry Okay. That's the picture. The, the, a bold priest to come into the presence of God. And second, a blood sacrifice. A blood sacrifice. Because in order to cover over the sins, there had to be a blood sacrifice. Don't miss the practical application here. Please don't miss it. See how significant Leviticus is. Number one, God is holy. Leviticus teaches us that if we're going to bring something to God, it better be worthy of bringing it to God. He is holy. The implications here are profound. You don't bring junk, you don't bring trash, you don't bring second best, and you don't bring that which costs you nothing into the presence of God. You don't offer him meaningless sacrifices. He's holy. He deserves much more than that. It's a worthy sacrifice. Second, sin is serious. Leviticus teaches us that sin before God is very costly. And worship is expensive. Sin is serious. And then finally, God is gracious. When you take those two, first two together, God is holy and sin is serious. It's not a good picture. However, you get to that third truth and you see God providing to atone and cover for people's sins. Then it begins to unfold what God has done in each of our lives. Christ has paid a high price price on the cross, a high price to cover over our sins. If, if we want to understand the price of the cross, we've got to study the book of Leviticus. 